Last week, Queen Elizabeth II marked her platinum jubilee. 70 years on the throne. She is the only monarch most of us have ever known. When the Queen came to the throne, we were still running an empire. Spanning generations, from the terrible aftermath of World War II through all the trials and tribulations since. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. In the Queen's world, if you had a headache or you were miserable, you just had a large martini. You didn't moan about it. But perhaps she has faced no greater challenge in her long reign than with her own family. And I suppose in love. Of course. Whatever in love means. <laughs> First came the world's most public divorce after a marriage made for three. My father and my brother, they are trapped within the system. Most recently, the royal grandson's escape to America with Britain's most hated woman. They are acting as if they are both royal, but also global celebrities. And through it all... You were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. The shame of Andrew, now stripped of his royal titles. It, it seems almost like the enemy is within. That is a source of tension that really needs to be resolved. Tonight, with our panel of experts, we'll investigate the future of the monarchy beyond the reign of Queen Elizabeth. I think the time has come for us to move away from that system. Will the monarchy end with her? Charles, Prince of Wales. Will we bow to King Charles? For the next hundred years, a white Protestant male head of state. Or will we finally become a republic? We need to look at our indigenous yep. history and our multicultural history. As we celebrate the incredible life of Queen Elizabeth, our experts will also investigate the impact of her death. It's not just the passing of the Queen, it's the passing of a whole way of life. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me from London, Ingrid Seward, Editor-in-Chief of Majesty magazine and the doyen of British Royal Commentators. Geoffrey Robertson, QC, international human rights lawyer and confirmed Republican. And the Right Honourable Norman Baker, former British Minister of State and Privy Council member. In Melbourne, former Victorian Premier and supporter of the monarchy, the Honourable Jeff Kennett. In Sydney, Dr. Cindy McCreary, cultural historian at Sydney University. And Professor Dennis Altman from La Trobe University, who recently authored a book on constitutional monarchies. Our experts come with strong and diverse views, but on one, when news of the Queen's death comes, they are united. Her death will be met, I think, with gratitude because of her long service. There will be muffled drums, there will be church bells ringing, there will be 21 gun salutes, and uh, it will be an enormously dignified time. Well, the Queen has been part of everybody's life for a very long time. I mean, I'm almost at retirement age. She was on the throne when I was born, so there will be a, a complete change in, in uh, the nation. Uh, a fixed point, if you like, in people's lives will have disappeared. There are very few human beings who have been in a high office for so many, many decades and seen such enormous change. So it will be a time of mourning uh, by the majority when people can pay homage and say thank you to what has been a remarkable life. It is really, really the end of an era. It's the end of an era that most of us have only ever known. It will be a turning point in history. And in years to come, it's very likely you will remember where you were when you heard the news. The passing of the Queen of England, Elizabeth II. And there is no one more keenly aware of the impact of her death on the nation and how it should be treated than the Queen herself. 
As a young woman, she witnessed the grand ceremony of her father's funeral. For the past 50 years, there have been regular meetings to plan for Her Majesty's passing and her succession, right down to the last detail. It is in many ways her final duty in a life where duty has distinguished her. The Queen has been a party to all of these plans. Oh, absolutely. I mean, part of the job of the monarch is to assure the succession that the queen is dead, long live the king in this case. So she has been very much involved in all, in all the plans. At the moment of the queen's passing, a message will flash out from Buckingham Palace stating, London Bridge is down. From inside the castle, one voice will speak the words that will become a national chorus. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. Prince Charles will immediately be King. The minute his mother passes, he will be King. Cindy, there's no doubt that um, uh, because the protocol, the monarchy, is set up such that Charles gets the job. Mm -hmm. It can't go to William. We no. should make that clear. No, that's right. There's an act of succession and it will go yes. to Charles. But he is, of course, in his 70s and is, that's a very different age and stage to become a monarch. Queen Elizabeth, of course, came to the throne when she was in her 20s. Um, so it's a very different ballgame here. According to Operation London Bridge, on the 10th day following her death, the Queen's funeral will be held at Westminster Abbey. There will be Queues. I think they will stretch for miles. People paying tribute as they shuffle past her open coffin. It's a, that's an unusual thing for Britain. And for three days, you'll be able to see the late Queen. It will be the final act of a life spent on camera. The first truly modern monarch. I declare before you all that my whole life whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family. On her 21st birthday, when she dedicated her life to service, she did it in front of a camera. When she was crowned at 27, she was the first British monarch whose coronation was televised. The trumpets are sounded and the bells are rung. People in the city and town of London salute this moment of crowning. And so the Queen's funeral will also be a global television event, unmatched by any in modern royal history, except perhaps by one the death of Princess Diana in 1997. I think it will be very strong emotion. Some people say, well, nothing will ever be like Diana, but this will be more exaggerated even than Diana. There probably won't be seat carpets of flowers and people sobbing, but I think people will be, in a way, you know, almost nervous. What, what is the future? Of all the monarchies in the world, this is probably the best known and the most respected. And so when this event takes place, it will be watched by millions of people all around the world. Is it appropriate? I think it is. The question is whether or not this is really simply about uh, paying tribute to the Queen and her public service, or, or whether it's also about bringing Charles into the limelight. <laughs> Coming up, He's been practicing for many, many years. King Charles. Mummy. And Queen Camilla. Camilla, I think, now appears to be the sanest and most sensible of the entire family. And you can't leave her alone. The crown effect. He's portrayed in a very, very unpleasant way. Will it drive Australia to becoming a republic? I find it very odd that a British family are seen as the appropriate people to be the heads of state here. That's next on Under Investigation. understand the endurance of the Queen, 
Consider the changes she's seen during her reign. Don't get hung up on the old days. A nation still recovering from World War II. The space race, man landing on the moon, the Cold War and the collapse of communism, the birth and boom of the digital age. You see 16 people. I may not look so good tomorrow. <laughs> and through it all, the Queen remained in place, steadfast, dependable, unchanging. Thank you for making me feel so old. <laughs> This has been the great thing about the Queen's reign, is this duty. Everything is duty. I mean, she's basically had no life of her own. And I think the younger members of the royal family find this also very hard because we live in a completely different world. We live in a world when you think about yourself and it's me and how you feel. And But in the Queen's world, you know, if you had a headache or you were depressed or you were miserable, you just had a large martini. Quite honestly, you didn't moan about it. Does football look that good? Is it, is it I don't coming? Know, I haven't been in it for ages. I have no way to see that. There are very few jobs you start in your 70s. Very little. There is a very little. Terribly little. Prince Charles has been heir to the throne, king in waiting, his whole life. It is my sincere wish that the Commonwealth will decide that one day the Prince of Wales should carry on the important work started by my father in 1949. But will a lifetime of preparation count for much when it comes to leading the royal family, the UK, and constitutional monarchies like Australia to a new and very different age? Mummy. Whereas the Queen was an undisputed celebrity, Charles has so far, to many, seemed more a curiosity. I'm wondering whether to buy a pig or not. They're rather nice. Children always love those, don't they? Pigs. The only thing you can say for sure, Liz, he's been practising for many, many years. Former Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett has some sympathy for Prince Charles. He, like all of us, is not perfect, and he's had his ups and downs. But a couple of things in his favour. He's worked very hard since the incidents that have cost or, or caused a lot of publicity. How's he going to perform? I don't know, but I wouldn't worry about his age, for goodness sake. He's still very young. He, he could <laughs> live to his grandmother's age. I would think that Charles has been waiting for this for a very long time. I would have thought he would want to revel in that and enjoy his reign um, before perhaps passing it on to William. I do think that the monarchy will modernise hugely when Prince Charles comes to the throne. Because the Queen has been Queen since 1952, I mean, there are parts of the monarchy which, you know, are archaic. And Charles has got a big, big job in front of him to modernise things, and he will start by modernising the coronation service. Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1952 cost Britain the equivalent of nearly $100 million. But Ingrid Seward believes Charles will opt for something more humble, a low-key crowning. It won't be nearly so elaborate and nearly so long because I don't think the people of Great Britain and the realms will want to have something of that magnitude in this day and age because it's going to cost so much. There's no doubt Charles will feel the shadow of his mother as he attempts to make the monarchy his own. But there's another, longer shadow he may find more difficult to move beyond. And I suppose in love. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> that of Diana, the world's princess whose fairy tale became a tragedy for which many blamed Charles and his mistress, Camilla. And Jeffrey Robinson, I think you wrote that uh, Charles will be a king without the magic of his mother. But that also brings me to Camilla. What yes. will be the magic of this, that situation, how is that going to be dealt with? Well, I think that's their best chance. I mean, I know Charles, I know Camilla. I think she is quite an extraordinary woman who's been derided for a long time. Australian human rights lawyer and QC Geoffrey Robertson has lived and worked in the UK for decades. She now appears to be the sanest and most sensible of the entire family. 
sure she's a chain smoker, but that, that's seen <laughs> as part of her independence. And so uh, she is likely Queen Camilla to be accepted. I think Charles will be a good king for England. <laughs> Jeff Kennett, is Camilla a stumbling block at all, do you think? <laughs> I, I love this conversation that we're discussing a member of the royal family and whether she smokes or not. I said, uh, look, I think you Well, that's I what the English could, press I are interested could, in. I think you could easily be surprised at how well they both will perform. Okay, on your left. And I would certainly want to give them every opportunity to perform well, rather than at this stage, trying to point out their failures and their weaknesses and not their strengths. They're well trained to do the job that they are going to be called upon to do at one stage. I hope they do it well for the UK, for the family's sake, and for all of those who respect the monarchy. Well, I think the ghost of Diana has reappeared in force. And I think that the, the, the young people of this country that don't remember Diana being a physical presence and they just see things like the crown and they must think that Prince Charles is the most awful man. I have done my best, my very best, and I am suffering. No, you are not suffering. We're all suffering having to put up with this. He's portrayed in a very, very unpleasant way most of the time, and therefore Camilla is also part of the problem because she was the one that he fell in love with when he was married to Diana, or well before he was married to Diana, to be exactly right. So I think there is a, a problem amongst perhaps the, the younger people in this country uh, with accepting Camilla, but maybe people will give her the benefit of the doubt. Norman Baker, what do you say? Well, I mean, um, historically, you've got to go back to the fact that we were told that um, Camilla would be princess consort and that she wouldn't be queen. Uh, and clearly, Charles would like her to be queen. I don't think it matters very much, to be honest with you, one way or the other. And I don't think the public at large will will uh, re will revolt if, uh, if she becomes queen. Uh, but the memory of Diana is still there. And the fact that uh, Charles was, was in a kind of menage a trois, for, in effect, with uh, Camilla and Diana at the same time is not uh, a great look for, for our new king. <laughs> Coming up, he wanted to meddle as much as he could when he was Prince of Wales. Will the meddlesome prince <laughs> derail the royal future? I think that's a danger for Charles. It seems almost like the enemy is within. Or will his brother Andrew do it for him? That is a source of tension and confusion that really needs to be resolved. That's next on Under Investigation. I love these turkeys, they make me laugh so much. Go, go, go. <laughs> the next King of England has long been viewed as a rather quirky prince. Hello, horror. <laughs> but if there's one thing Charles will bring to the throne, it's opinions. It's entirely because I worry about your grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren as well as my own. In 2015, a series of 27 letters from Prince Charles lobbying government ministers and politicians were made public. They became known as the Black Spider Memos after Prince Charles' handwriting, and they earned him the nickname of the Meddling Prince. Underpinning principles for the monarchy is one of political neutrality and therefore being seen to influence in this way may be an uncomfortable process. He's looking up. Is he going to be a meddling king? Absolutely won't be a meddling king. I think he wanted to meddle as much as he could when he was Prince of Wales. And he certainly won't be a meddling king. That would be far, far too dangerous a thing to try and do. Perhaps the opinion Charles has shared most and loudest is his view on climate change. Climate change and biodiversity loss pose an even greater existential threat. We have to put ourselves on what might be called a warlike footing. It's a position that may win him support and admiration as king. 
He is seen right now as perhaps being one of the first people in the world to start arguing about the importance of climate. And I think you've got to give him some credit for that. Jeff is right in Charles's green credentials. I happily talk to the plants, of course, you know, the trees and all these other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to them. <laughs> when he started by saying, I talk to the plants and they listen to me. Everyone was put in mind of Spike Milligan. Uh, I talked to the trees, that's why they took me away. But uh, Charles has, has got genuine green credentials at a time when the Australian Prime Minister was saying climate change is crap. And the next Prime Minister was bringing a lump of coal into Parliament to worship. You know, there's nothing worse than people lecturing uh, the population at large uh, on what they should do and not applying the lesson to themselves. And I think that's a danger for Charles. These days, former British Minister of State Norman Baker casts a rather critical eye over the royals. Yes, he has been, uh, as Jeff says, leading the campaign on the environment for many years, but he undermines his own case by insisting on taking private jets everywhere, by taking helicopters to go to Cambridge to lecture people on, on, on climate change. But, sir, uh, with due respect, as a former politician, the senior politicians take planes and helicopters, etc. Yes, they do, et they do. And I guarantee the royal family in the UK earn more money for the UK than any of you politicians, with due respect. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true, but uh, one of the arguments put in favour of monarchy uh, is that it helps the tourist industry. I really don't think we should base our constitutional arrangements on what tourists want. The Queen's father coined the term the firm for the House of Windsor. And the royal firm both makes and costs a lot of money. Where that balance lies is largely up to your opinion of their value to the nation. The Royals are a massive tourist draw for visitors to the UK. But they're also funded by British taxpayers to the tune of millions of pounds a year. Over the past decade, largely due to the cost of repairing Buckingham Palace, the amount paid to the Queen increased an astounding 980%. The monarchy in this country cost £86 million pounds a year, plus all the costs of security, plus all the tax breaks. Compare that with, say, Sweden, where the monarchy costs £6 million pounds a year. Or they seven, go on bicycles or, in Sweden. Indeed, or seven uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Spain. Um, the cost of the monarchy here is enormous compared to those other countries. So we need to change this. What Prince Charles will do is he will slim down the monarchy. He's spoken about it enough. He will definitely, when he ascends the throne, there will be far less members of the royal family. There will be him and his immediate family. And I, I think that the, the rest of the royal family will not be a part of it because the more of them that there are, the more problems that they have. Over the centuries, royalty and scandal have gone hand in hand. But the current royal family has set its own benchmark. As Queen Elizabeth's long reign met the age of celebrity, the era of paparazzi and gossip magazines, the royal family became tabloid fodder for the world. If you read the British tabloids, you'll find that they're full of Andrew's alleged sexual misdeeds of the breakup with Harry and Meghan. This is a kind of public entertainment in which everyone can share. They, uh, to that extent, that's the function of the monarchy. We should not pretend that it has any exalted place in the constitution. You tell me one family that hasn't had problems within its ranks over the years. I mean, you seem to think that the monarchy, the human beings that make up the family, are somehow different from us all in terms of their makeup, etc. They're not, they're clearly not. But there's a great deal of value, particularly for the UK, I think, in the monarchy continuing. Uh, the royal family themselves decided to open up matters with a film called, I think, just called the royal family in 1969 on the BBC. The standard is ready. Good. 
Uh, and since then, they've wanted to, to walk this difficult tightrope between being celebrities on the one side uh, and having the respect from uh, standing on a pedestal on the other. So they object violently to the press intrusion and coverage of uh, their foibles. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, they want to be fully respected. Yeah, Ingrid, it's a tricky business, isn't it? Because they understand popularity. They play to that popularity. It's important to, for them to be popular, um, but yet they want to be very private. One thing they absolutely hate is being uh, called celebrities and being there for an amusement value. But uh, again, they, they know that once you're be put on a pedestal, there's only one way, and that's to be knocked off. And it is essential that they have respect of the people, otherwise there is no monarchy. And the respect of the people has been sorely tested over the years. We want to do a big deal with Andrew, then that just... Sarah Ferguson, when she was a duchess, was famously filmed trying to cut a cash for access deal involving her then husband, Prince Andrew. Buy £100,000 pounds when you can to me. Open doors. And then there is Andrew close friends with convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. You were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. In trying to dodge the scandal, Prince Andrew secured the title of worst ever royal interview on the BBC. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating. There's a slight problem with, with, with the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat. Embroiled in a court case in the US in which he's accused of raping an underage girl, the Queen has now stripped Andrew of his royal titles. Doesn't matter how many contacts you have, doesn't matter who your family is, doesn't matter how much wealth you have, you're not above the law. With the passing of the crown to Charles, it isn't just the scandal of his brother Andrew that he'll have to manage. Thank you everybody for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It's, it just means so much. It's also his wayward son, Prince Harry, and daughter-in-law Meghan, trading on their royal connection in the US, polarizing public opinion and providing a constant unwelcome distraction from the real business of ruling. My father and my brother, they are trapped. They don't get to leave and I have huge compassion for that. It seems almost like the enemy is within. We've got Harry and Meghan basically s suggesting that Charles and, and William are trapped. Well, I think that that's, uh, you know, they, they might be trapped, but they've never been anywhere else. So I think they were born in the trap. So was Harry. Harry has just chosen to get out of it, but Charles and William, they intend to stay there and do their duty. Cultural historian at Sydney University, Dr. Cindy McCreary, has extensively researched the monarchy. I think that there is going to be challenges in the future for Charles with his relationship with, with his son Harry and Meghan, um, because they are at the moment um, acting as if they are both royal, but also uh, global yeah. celebrities. And I think that is a source of tension um, and confusion that really needs to be resolved if, if Charles is to uh, proceed with this slimmed down monarchy in any kind of consistent way. Look, the Oprah interview was watched by almost two million Australians, even though it was on Channel 10. So what we've got to understand is that the main service of the monarchy is entertainment. Can I make one point about the monarch and celebrity? And it's to remind us all of that moment in the Olympics in London, when the Queen appeared with Daniel Craig as James Bond. Pretty nice totally in the celebrity world, but then went into the royal box and everybody stood. Never can Her Majesty. The Queen has been brilliant, I think, at combining celebrity and majesty, and it is possible to do that. Whether or not this is a good thing for Britain, I leave to the many people from Britain on the panel. I think it's not a good thing for us in Australia because we don't have our own monarchy in place and we are living with essentially a Clayton's Governor-General. 
Coming up... Well, may we say, God save the Queen. The future King of Australia... Because nothing will save the Governor-General. ..who applauded the sacking of our government. It could happen again because we haven't changed the law to prevent it ever happening again. That's next. Jeff Kennett, would you accept the job of Governor-General if offered? Who, me? On Under Investigation. The monarch in Australia is represented by the Governor-General and we've largely supported the notion of a Queen above politics. That was until November the 11th, 1975. Proclamation by His Excellency the Governor-General of Australia. And the infamous dismissal when Governor-General Sir John Kerr sacked Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. Well, may we say God save the Queen. because nothing will save the Governor-General. Many believe the dismissal of Gough Whitlam had the direct knowledge and support of the Queen and Prince Charles. But if so, it backfired. For the first time, Australians seriously questioned the power the Queen has over our nation. Uh, life is wonderful for all of us. And her Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, became an almost comic, tragic figure. So under King Charles, could the dismissal happen again? Well, Charles, when he was a much younger man, wrote a letter to John Kerr congratulating him on sacking the Whitlam government. A wise and courageous act. Now, that will come back to haunt him. But it could happen again because we haven't changed the law in order to prevent it ever happening again. Politics works by following convention. I think that anybody who is going to be in the situation of a Governor-General in our system will not want to repeat what Sir John Kerr did. You would need to get a quite extraordinary situation for, for, I think, that to happen. Of course, all sorts of things could happen. Tony Abbott could become Prime Minister again. He could, uh, Sir Anthony Abbott could bring back a royal to be Governor General. One could envisage a situation if Meghan and Harry's ratings fall on Netflix or if Disney voiceovers don't pay, they might come back demand to be of service and King Charles might look for a place to put them and the Australians might offer Yarra Lumla, which no one would have heard of. We've, we've and, closed uh, our borders, could, Geoffrey. We've closed they our borders. They could be, uh, no, they could be job share Governor Generals. They might be very popular. Jeff Kennett, would you uh, accept the job of Governor General if offered? Who, me? You. Oh, well, goodness. <laughs> Uh, not this week, no, not this week. And why not? I'd be happy to vote for you as president. Would you, Geoffrey? <laughs> yes, I would. You'd be as good as any and probably better than most. <laughs> but will the Republican spirit fire up again with the passing of the Queen? The question of an Australian Republic with our own head of state has faced us once at a referendum in 1999. Becoming a republic is not about barracking for your favourite team. The cause championed by Eddie McGuire and Malcolm Turnbull. We're going to win because people aren't going to be taken in by the, uh, by the campaign of lies. We voted no. Our hearts may be broken tonight, but our spirits are unbroken. What I find fascinating is Charles III also succeeds as the head of state of Australia. None of us will have any opportunity whatsoever to question whether that is appropriate. According to the Australian Constitution, it is automatic. I mean, for the next hundred years, Australia will have a white, Anglo-German, Protestant, male head of state. They'll have Charles III, William V, George VII. That's what Australia has to look forward to. There's an issue for the monarchy in the UK and there's an issue for the monarchy here in Australia and they're different arguments and Dennis complains that when the baton 
passes to Charles, we haven't got a say in it. Uh, we've known about that for years, Dennis. Do you think, Can do, I do, say do, that I actually agree with Jeff much more than he might expect? And Jeff, I wasn't complaining. I was oh, merely making. Of course, you were, Dennis. No, of I was course merely, you were. No, I was merely making the point that not only do we not choose our head of state, our head of state does not live here. Our head of state does not speak for us. I find it very odd that a British family are seen as the appropriate people to be the heads of state here. I agree there's a difference between the effect on Australia and the impact on Britain. Actually, my sense is the British public at large is somewhere in the middle. In fact, it prepared to have a monarchy, but it wants a monarchy which is substantially changed from the one we've got. And the reason we haven't pushed it too far is out of respect for the Queen, who's there in a personal capacity. And, and the respect for the Queen is different from the respect for the monarchy. Coming up... I think change is inevitable. The death of the Queen. Will it be an end? Britain's role has diminished enormously over her reign. Or a new beginning. We need to look at our own history, our Indigenous yep. history and our multicultural history. Our experts cast judgment. It will take a long time before Australia changes. That's next on Under Investigation. In the 21st century, it's reasonable to question the relevance of monarchies. The notion of being born to rule seems outdated and out of place in modern societies. But according to the research of avowed Republican, Professor Dennis Altman, constitutional monarchies are the most stable, successful systems of government on earth. I think monarchies survive because they provide continuity, they provide a sense of tradition, and they provide a check against the excesses of politicians. But I think that in countries that have retained a monarchy and have retained democratic systems, people feel a strong connection to the monarchy. We grow up with the royals, and we see that as a continuation. I think Norman made the point that things are changing rapidly. And in a time of rapid change, there is something very comforting about the presence of a royal family. It is a strange existence to be queen, an existence that only a truly extraordinary woman could do justice to when the institution is constantly questioned. The echo of one. And it's worth considering the outsized shadow cast by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. In her instantly recognisable iridescent hats and coats, she's calmly maintained a fixed smile while facing unending crowds and a revolving door of world leaders. The Queen. But for all that, it's to be remembered, the Queen is also very human. Soon you'll be gone. Well, I think um, the Queen is the strength and core of the monarchy, and I think we've all discussed tonight that history will probably be very kind to her. But I want to ask you all uh, in final comments, um, the future of the, the monarchy, Dennis. Well, I think I mean, we have to make, of course, the distinction between Britain and Australia. Um, I think while a majority of Australians, if pushed, would find it very difficult to defend the present system, I also suspect a majority will not be mobilised to vote against it. My sense is it will take a long time before Australia changes. I think that um, the monarchy does mean different things in Britain than Australia. And I think going forward that we will see some um, continuation of the monarchy and as much pomp and circumstance as they can afford. Uh, I think in Australia it's a different situation and I think that we as need to look at our own history, not just in terms of our relationship with Britain, as mm. important as it is, 
but in terms of our Indigenous yep. history and our multicultural history and think about who we are today as a nation and who we want to be. And to remember that we actually don't need to wait until the change of monarch in Britain for us to change our own um, form of government. I think as we go forward, um, it's an opportunity for Britain to reflect upon itself. And when the Queen came to the throne, we were still running an empire. Uh, we'd only just lost India. You know, Britain's role has diminished enormously over her over this reign. It's not the Queen's fault, of course, but that's that's the reality of what's happened to to Britain. Ingrid, um, presumably, you will mourn deeply the, the Queen's death. Um, and uh, but do you think change is inevitable? Because she was the mainstay. I think change is inevitable, and I think we need to support our monarchy, to be proud of them, and it's up to Charles to carry this on, and I think he will be able to do it, and I think he will do it very, very well. I have great respect for him, and I sincerely hope that the rest of the British people and the people of the UK have the same feeling. The monarchy will go on. I think Charles will be a goodish king of England, uh, but for Australia, it, it's absurd. We'll be the last of the Commonwealth countries to have the monarch as our head of state. And it looks ludicrous. Let's grow up as Australians and have our own head of state, even if it's Jeff Kennett. <laughs> I think the monarchy will survive, and I think Charles and Camilla will do a much better job than many commentators are trying to suggest. In terms of Australia, I agree. I think the time has come for us to move away from that system. Why? Because we have a lot of younger people who have no relationship to the monarchy whatsoever, or to the UK. We have a multicultural community. Uh, Cindy talks about our first peoples, our indigenous people. So I think the time will come. Uh, but you've got to decide on a very simple method of replacing what we've already got. Because what we've got at the moment has worked, although it has been argued against, what you want to do is to put into place something that is better and will see us through for the rest of time. Tonight should give us pause to consider the extraordinary life's work of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. By any measure, her devotion and duty to her country is worthy of our deepest respect. I'm Liz Hayes. Thank you for joining me on this special edition of Under Investigation. Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.